So yeah, thanks very much, Alison, for the introduction. Pleasure. Thank you, Closer, for inviting me, and thank you all for coming, um, coming today. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about preventing non-response in longitudinal surveys, and I realise the kind of title of my kind of um, presentation is quite quite broad. So I just wanted to kind of say a few words at the beginning um, about the scope of what I'm going to cover. So. Um, first of all, I just wanted to clarify that I'll be talking about unit non-response rather than item non-response. So this is individuals or households who just don't take part in our surveys at all rather than um, people not answering particular questions. I'm talking about preventing non-response rather than adjusting from it for, uh, for it afterwards, which I think Dick will talk about afterwards. Um, I'm going to be focusing mostly on kind of non-response rate or the level of non-response in surveys rather than on non-response bias. And in part, that's because a lot of the literature is focused on minimising the rate or the level of non-response rather than, rather than on bias. But we, can, we can come back to that discussion later. Um, in terms of the sort of type or scope of longitudinal surveys, most of what I'm saying is kind of based on evidence or is kind of broadly applicable to kind of large scale face to face kind of general population surveys and also broadly applicable to kind of both sort of panel, household panel and cohort surveys because obviously there's lots of different types of longitudinal surveys. But I'm not really going to kind of get into the sort of details around, obviously there are some issues which are more pertinent for panel studies versus cohort studies and like and um, different modes, which I'm not going to kind of really get into in a lot of detail. Um, I'm going to try the literature that I'm reviewing is kind of this broad kind of survey methods literature, and it is a review paper rather than an empirical paper. So although I'll be kind of telling you at kind of quite a broad level what the findings in the literature is, I don't have lots of tables with um, numbers. In fact, I don't think I have any slides with numbers. So if you've come looking for numbers, you'll have to wait for um, Dick's presentation. No. no. Oh, Dick doesn't have any numbers either. Oh, well. <laughs> so, sorry, you'll be disappointed. Um, so just a, f a, a few kind of general words about kind of non-response just to kind of motivate and kind of foreground the presentation. So I'm just going to kind of say these things very briefly as these are kind of commonly held um, understandings kind of from the literature. So first of all, non-response, certainly in the context of social surveys, of voluntary social surveys and biomedical surveys, is inevitable. Um, the, we generally do voluntary surveys rather than things, surveys that people are forced to take part in. So therefore, um, you know, some, it's inevitable that some people will choose not to take part in our surveys. Um, so when we talk about preventing non-response, we're really talking about kind of minimising or reducing the kind of level of non-response. Um, so non-response can lead to bias in survey estimates, which is kind of one of the main reasons we're concerned and there's, we, we research how to minimise non-response. Um, so bias is when the survey estimates kind of differ from the true value in the population. But I think it's important to note that non-response does not necessarily lead to bias and it kind of depends on the, um, it depends on the extent to which the predictors of response are related to the actual survey estimates themselves. Um, so having a kind of lower non-response rate does not necessarily mean you have lower non-response bias and having a higher non-response rate does not necessarily mean you have higher non-response bias. And ever, having said that, it's still important to minimise non-response rate because all, kind of all other things being equal, that will minimise the risk of bias at least. Um, I think there's, it's commonly held, there's lots, well, there's lots of evidence that non-response has been increase, increasing over time. It's been a concern in the survey methods literature since at least the 1970s. There's lots of papers which have trend data for cross-sectional surveys showing increasing non-response rates. Um, and it's also lots of evidence that it's becoming more difficult or costly to, um, to maximise response rates or minimise non-response over time. Non-response has got multiple sources, so we're not talking about kind of one homogenous thing, and they've all got different causes. And I'll say a bit more about that in the context of longitudinal surveys in a moment. And also, I think it's important, particularly in the context of longitudinal surveys, to note that kind of being a non-respondent or not taking part is not necessarily a permanent state. So we quite often observe in longitudinal surveys people choosing not to take part at one point in time, but then perhaps coming back into the study later on. So it's not a kind of permanent state. So. Um, non-respondents can move to being respondents and vice versa. So um, in terms of non-response in longitudinal surveys, so there are kind of three main um, sort of sources or kind of reasons why kind of non-response will occur in longitudinal surveys. Um, so, the f so the first one is kind of location. So this is because uh, this is a particular form of non-response which is specific to longitudinal surveys because we follow people over time then we need to follow them if they move um, geographical location. Um, so 
non-response due to failure to locate them is a particular problem for longitudinal surveys, which doesn't really apply, at least not in the same way, for cross-sectional surveys. Um, contact and cooperation, so failure to make contact and failure to make with, with the sampled unit or sampled person and failure to persuade them to take part or other kind of reasons as well. And those two also apply to kind of cross-sectional surveys. Um, so I think in, in both quite sectional and longitudinal surveys, we find that kind of non-cooperation or refusals is the biggest reason for non-response, followed by kind of mostly, followed by location in longitudinal surveys and then kind of with contact being less, um, usually less, um, less, of an issue, less of a kind of problem once you've located somebody. Um, so the other things to note about these, pro these sources of non-response is, is it's a conditional process, so we have to locate people first, then we have to make contact with them, then we have to persuade them to take part. Um, so what I'm going to try to do, I think, in the rest of the presentation is to kind of go through each of these in turn and just to kind of give you an overview of the kind of literature in relation to each of them. Um, I think the, so the other thing to note in, long, in the context of longitudinal surveys, of course, is that the non-response process doesn't just happen once, it happens multiple times. So um, at each wave of data collection, they will have a certain level of non-response. Um, but then when we go back to people in the next wave of data collection, um, we're also interested in the kind of non-response in, in, in those waves as well. So we're interested in non-response at particular points in time, but also over time as well in the context of longitudinal surveys. So the term attrition is, is often used to refer to kind of non-response over time in longitudinal surveys. So, um, just before I sort of talk, start talking about the literature, I just wanted to say a few words about the sort of some conceptual frameworks that are commonly used in the literature around non-response. And I don't want to spend too much um, time on this, but I think it's so. I just a couple of things to point out. One is that there are kind of quite well developed kind of separate conceptual frameworks for each of these different processes in the literature, so location, contact and cooperation. So I've put the main references on the slide, but those references, you know, they have um, fantastic kind of nice diagrams which kind of um, show all the different factors that are related to non-response and how they relate to each other. Um, and there are separate conceptual frameworks for each of them. Um, so we, it's really important that we think of non-response in these, in these, um, as these separate kind of processes rather than one, one process together. Um, and I think some commonalities between on all of the conceptual frameworks is that they make a key distinction between things which are outside the researcher's control, so things like to do with the social environment or the society, which may vary over time and over societies, but there's not much you can really do about that at a particular point in time. Um, and also things about the respondents. We can't really control our respondents that well, so <laughs> as much as we'd like to, um, we have a limited amount of kind of control over them. Um, but the factors that are more within our, our control as survey researchers are, so interviewers um, to perhaps a greater or lesser extent, and um, uh, also the survey design features, so how we choose to design our surveys. And so I'm mostly going to focus on the literature in relation to kind of things that are within our control as, as survey researchers, so survey design and interview, um, survey design features and interviewers. Um, and again, in the context of a, of a longitudinal survey, these things are not fixed at one point in time. They will change over time as well. The, we, the interviews will cha may change, and also the way that we design our survey may change over time in, in the context of a longitudinal survey. Um, so yeah, as survey practitioners, we're really interested in things that we can do to, um, to prevent or minimise non-response. So we're, we're interested in things that we can kind of, that we have some control over. So first of all, talking about a bit more about location. So I think the first thing to say about location is um, locating sample members is only a problem if they move. So it's kind of an obvious point, but I think it's important to remember. Um, and a lot of them don't move, so that's kind of good. And obviously the... Um, the proportion of, so, so essentially the kind of level of non-response due to failure to locate will be a kind of product of the proportion of sample members in your population who move between each wave and the proportion that you can locate. So different, um, different studies have got different populations and so the level of the mobility levels will vary between different populations and different subgroups of the population and they may also vary over time. So the level of mobility in your sample, in your cohort, in your sample or your cohort 
is one is going to be one of the kind of big determinants of your kind of non-response rate due to, to location, regardless of how kind of good your tracing procedures are or your your procedures are to locate them. I think the other key thing to rem to remember about to, to note about the location problem in particular is that some of the we know that some the drivers of people moving are very often kind of changes in circumstances. So. Um, change, job changes, marital status changes, we, and these are the very things that this, as longitudinal survey practitioners or researchers we're really interested in measuring over time. So in some ways location is perhaps arguably one of the most kind of more problematic reasons for non-response I would say in, in longitudinal surveys because it's so likely to be driven by the things that we're change which is and, that, and we're very and that's the very thing we want to measure. Um, so um, in terms of the literature on location, so um, so first of all, the kind of duration between the, the, the time between um, data collection waves will obviously be a determinant of of the level of uh, non-response due to location. So the longer the interval between waves, then the lo the more chance there is for people to move or for contact details to get out of date. Um, the definition of your population or your f the following rules can also influence this as well. So if you are only following some people in the household um, then, um, or if you're only following people within certain geographic areas, then you may have a lower le rate of kind of non-response due to a failure to locate. Um, quite a lot of the there's quite a lot of literature about, um, well, there's quite a lot of literature about kind of different typologies of what's called tracking methods. So the way the methods that we use to try and, and locate people when they move are what are referred to as kind of tracking methods. And there are various distinctions um, in the literature between kind of retrospective methods which follow which try to um, try to locate people once they've moved, prospective methods which um, prevent which prevent kind of prevent the loss of contact things that can be done remotely versus things that can be done in the field, and also things that can be done at a kind of batch level versus things that can be done at a case level. So, but I think the literature in general, and I think a lot, of, a lot of longitudinal studies have got kind of quite well-developed tracking methods, which are very effective, um, but there's less literature on um, kind of the cost effectiveness of them, because they're also quite expensive. So there's very less in the literature about kind of which particular tracking methods are the most effective and kind of how to maximise the kind of cost effectiveness of tracking. So that's kind of the, one of the key, kind of key themes in the literature. Um, the main exception to that, I think, is that there's quite a lot of research about between wave mailings. Um, so this is where we write to sample members between waves to ask them to kind of update their contact details. And there's been quite a bit of research about that recently. I mean, it basically it shows that they are effective because they in, and they're cost effective in the sense that people who update their details have got less, um, are much easier to contact at the next wave. Um, and there's quite a bit of literature around the different design considerations, like how frequently to do them, reminders, whether it's better to get people to confirm the address or just, or just let you know of changes. So there's quite a bit of literature around that. There's quite a bit of interest around new technology, social media, but there's kind of less in the, in the literature around that. And also, some there's not very much at all, or I don't think, around uh, using administrative data for tracking. But there's, so that's something that we've been certainly doing recently on the cohort studies. But there's very little in the actual literature. So in terms of kind of priorities for research and location, then kind of tracking methods, their effectiveness, their cost effectiveness, how to optimise them, and potentially how to tailor them for different subpopulations as well, I think is important as well as kind of new technologies and admin data. Um, so in terms of contact, so um, I think the most of the literature on making minimising non-response due to non-contact is around the cost effectiveness of interviewer calling strategies. So around um, how to, you know, we, we know that kind of interviewers um, calling behaviours will be a kind of big determinant of the level of non-contact or how quickly it is um, to, to um, how quickly they can make contact with people, um, but it's also influenced by when people are avail available and what their kind of at-home patterns are as well. Um, so there's a lot of literature around this, um, showing kind of you know the more calls them they make, the more likely they are to get into contact with people. Plus also, um, you know that weekends are kind of better weekends and evenings are the best, better times to call and things like that. Um, but yeah, I think yeah the literature is has. A lot of the concern has been around things like 
whether um, so, so we find that quite a lot of people you can get in touch with quite easily, um, but then there's a quite a long tail to the distribution. So there's some sample members which take a lot of effort to get in touch with. So there's been quite a bit of research around whether these extended efforts to make contact are, um, are worthwhile in terms of minimising the response rate, but also minimising the re non-response bias. Um, there's some literature from telephone studies in the States which shows that actually the extended efforts are not necessary, don't necessarily pay off in terms of reducing non-response bias. But there's also some UK literature based on kind of cross-sectional face-to-face surveys which show that they actually do make and they do pay off in terms of non-response bias. Um, some particular things around longitudinal surveys are kind of can we use prior wave data to inform the best time to call? So, um, so this because on a longitudinal survey we know the characteristics of the respondents, we know whether they're working or not, so that might influence the at-home kind of availability. And But we also know when their previous wave interview was, so can we use that information to inform <coughs> um, the best time to call at the next wave? Obviously the problem with that is people's circumstances change, so, what's, um, so what was good in one wave may not necessarily be the best time for them to call at the next wave. Um, there's actually very little in the literature around this. Very few studies have actually done this, but for um, a couple of telephone surveys, have, um, there's, a, yeah, there's a couple of papers based on telephone surveys which have got differing results. So one showing it is effective and one showing it isn't. And there's one paper that I know of based on face-to-face um, -face surveys where they do this, but um, it shows that it makes a kind of marginal difference to, um, to fieldwork effort. And the other thing that we can obviously do on longitudinal surveys is use um, additional contact methods. So, um, so we have more contact information available um, for, for the participants, so we can use those to try and make contact. And also we can ask our respondents to, to make appointments with us. There's a, um, a couple of papers showing that that can, be cost that, that, that can um, reduce interviewer effort, but in order to get respondents to do that, you need to kind of... Um, incentivize them so you need to pay them money so um, whether it's it's cost effective is is up for debate I think so yeah in terms of further research on contact certainly I think there's scope for more research on using prior wave information it hasn't really been tried that much and also whether we can um, how best to use additional kind of con different contact strategies and information and respondents initiating contact so in terms of cooperation um, so in terms of interview level factors, there's again a lot of it there's a, a lot of evidence that in more inter experienced interviewers are better at uh, securing cooperation. Certain behaviours on the doorstep um, are um, related to securing cooperation, as are certain interview characteristics, mostly more to do with their attitudes and motivation than their personal characteristics. And there's a big strand of research in longitudinal surveys around co interview continuity. Um, but it's the problem with it is a lot of it is not kind of that methodologically robust because the in the case the, the interviews that stay on the panel um, are different from those that drop out etc so the research the robust evidence shows that interviewer continuity only makes a kind of marginal small difference to um, participation at future waves and only in particular sort of circumstances so it's not i think the kind of assumption that this is very important is not really actually accurate. Um, so in terms of um, more like survey design level factors, um, so survey topic is obviously important in general um, and as is interview length. In terms of longitudinal surveys there's some evidence um, that having a longer interview at one particular wave does not necessarily make you less likely to take part of the next wave as based on the understanding society. Data collection modes, um, there's, in general, we know that kind of face to, uh, interviewer modes are better than non-interviewer modes. There's not very much research evidence around changing mode in longitudinal surveys. There's a bit around the use of sequential mixed modes, which has been based on understanding society, society and changing those, but there's not very much in general around this on longitudinal surveys. Um, advanced notification, so we know that sending people advanced letters is effective. Um, respondent incentives, we know tons about long respondent incentives. Um, you know, we know that high value incentives are better than lower value incentives, that cash incentives are better than um, in kind incentives, and also that um, unconditional incentives are better than conditional incentives. Um, in the longitudinal survey context, 
there is evidence that high, kind of higher incentives and also unconditional incentives have a kind of positive effect in, uh, on attrition in future waves. So they actually you don't benefit. It's not just a one-off benefit to the response rate of a particular wave. It actually may, has a lasting impact on attrition in future waves. Um, very little evidence on interviewer incentives. So I think that's one of the big other areas um, for research. Sorry, yeah, so paying, um, incentivizing interviewers differently. There's quite a bit of evidence on reissuing and conversion, particularly in a kind of cross-sectional context, but also some evidence from um, BHPS and also from the Millennium Cohort Study that shows that um, reissuing cases, so uh, one wave doesn't, it does not have a detrimental effect at future waves. Um, okay. So in terms of further research, I would say there is, I think, some more scope for some research around um, interviewers in longitudinal surveys, and in particular, there's not very much evidence on their kind of particular doorstep behaviours or kind of behaviours of interviewers at initial contact in a longitudinal context and how that might be different. And I think there's also some scope for some other research around kind of continuity, so, and in particular, um, and in particular, when it's better not to send, when it's better not to send back the same interviewer as well. So there's some evidence um, that actually, for people who didn't take part, actually having a different interviewer is much more effective. And at survey design level, um, we've got interviewer incentive. Uh, I think there's more um, more research needed on kind of interviewer incentives, non monetary and also non monetary influences and in participation. And um, I have got a slide on recent trends in longitudinal research, but maybe I better stop since I've um, overrun slightly. I can leave that one up and I can, you can ask me about any questions. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah.